Parkinson's UK, Oxford Branch, invited Ray Dorsey and Baz Bloom to speak about their book, Ending Parkinson's Disease. We felt it was likely to be of interest to others, so we extended the invitation more widely. On the night, over 300 people connected, but we think nearer 450 were actually there. We've received many comments about how good it was. Well, we've recorded it, and we now offer it to you in the hope that you can use it to inspire more people to stand together and let the world know that we have a voice with a message. Boss and I are going to talk a little bit about the book, uh, about what we can do as a community to, one, prevent, and two, end uh, Parkinson's disease, and hopefully answer a lot of questions uh, from you. So how did we go from a rare neurological disease that Dr. James Parkinson described in London in 1817 to the world's fastest growing uh, brain disease? And so clearly he was writing something that at least in his eyes was new and had not been previously described and something that was concerning to him. And so he described people walking the streets of London with a fascinating gait, with a stoop posture, with a tremor. So it's worth considering what was going on in London at that time. Uh, London in 1817 was the capital of the Industrial Revolution. And tied to the Industrial Revolution were numerous products and byproducts uh, that have since been linked to Parkinson's disease. Uh, one of those is uh, air pollution. And as you all know, the London fog has little to do with weather and a lot to do with air pollution. Uh, this is a picture of the London fog from 1847. Uh, and if you look at it, it doesn't look too dissimilar from uh, modern day Beijing where the rates of Parkinson's disease are uh, increasing most rapidly. Another one is pesticides. And indeed the very first person that Dr. James Parkinson described in his case series of six was a horticulturalist, a gardener uh, who had spent his life working uh, with uh, plants and likely pesticides. Uh, could have been contributing uh, to his Parkinson's disease. Now that's just pure speculation. But since that time, numerous pesticides, many of which are nerve toxins, many of which target the parts of cells that are damaged in Parkinson's disease, and many of which, when you feed it to laboratory animals, reproduce the behavioral and pathological features of Parkinson's disease have been linked to it. Indeed, one called Paraquat is uh, considered the most toxic herbicide ever created. It kills the weeds that Roundup doesn't. Uh, it's been banned by 32 countries, including China. Uh, but the United States still permits its use, and its use has doubled over the last decade and increased by 20% in the last year. Now, England fortunately uh, bans the pesticide, but uh, England still exports it. So there are plants in uh, England that uh, manufacture this pesticide called Paraquat, which increases the risk of Parkinson's by about 150%. And so now Parkinson's disease is the world's fastest growing brain, dis brain disease. It's doubled over the last 25 years. Absent change will double again the coming uh, 25 years. Uh, so what can we do to uh, stop Parkinson's disease? So in the book that Boss and Michael and uh, Todd share, and I wrote, we put together a PACT, a P-A-C-T, to end Parkinson's disease. And I'm going to talk about the first two letters of that PACT, P-N-A, and then Boss will talk about uh, care and treatment. So the first uh, element of the pact is prevention. So Parkinson's disease, to a large extent, is not an inevitable consequence of aging. It is a preventable disease. When an unknown virus was uh, uniformly and rapidly fatal, first in the United, well, first in Africa, then the United States and the United Kingdom, and a group of uh, HIV activists adopted the, the motto of silence equals death. Silence equals death. And for Parkinson's disease, silence doesn't equal death, but silence equals suffering and needless and preventable suffering in a large number of cases. And we need to make our voices heard. If Parkinson's disease is the world's fastest growing brain disease, we need to raise that up to uh, our politicians and our leaders. There's 1.1 million Americans uh, who have the disease. We need to make our voices heard. And on the advocacy front, you know, the largest funder of biomedical research in the world is the National Institutes of Health in the United States, which spends about $200 million on Parkinson's research. That might sound like a lot until you think that the economic burden in the United States alone is $50 billion, $50 billion. 
So we spend less than 1% of the entire economic burden of Parkinson's disease on research aimed at preventing, measuring, and treating the disease. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to care and treatment uh, to my fellow neurologists in, in Europe. I think there are a number of problems in care as we currently deliver it. First, and I know this is also close to Ray's heart, is we ask people with Parkinson's to travel the long way to the hospital, even though we know that driving has become unsafe for many people with Parkinson's. And the spouse typically knows, as you can see in this photograph. Uh, we know that patients oftentimes take extra medication while sitting in the rating room to make a good impression on their doctors. And I don't mind telling my patients they look well. What I really want to hear is how they experience problems at home. <clears throat> I often peek around the corner and I see patients practicing the very tests <laughs> that we will be delivering in a minute, uh, again, only to make a good impression. And, and when I then see the patient uh, and the family, uh, I typically take a snapshot, a quick photograph of what is otherwise a complex and evolving, evolving film in daily life. And imagine, you know, you're in the hospital and you're suddenly doing really well despite all the problems at home, and that can be very frustrating. And in fact, we know that once a physician is looking at you, many patients perform paradoxically very well. Freezing of gait, for example, is notorious for being very debilitating at home. People can walk like never before in the hospital, um, uh, much to the frustration of the patient and the spouse, only to freeze again on the parking lot uh, on the way back to the car. So we think it is essential to see patients in their own living environment. We should come to you instead of you coming to us. Care for people with Parkinson's is and should be multidisciplinary. Think of the dentist, think of a gastroenterologist, a urologist, um, a neuro-ophthalmologist looking at eye problems. So the, the range of professional disciplines that can potentially be involved is, is more than 30. I think this tells you a lot about the complexity of Parkinson's. At the same time, it should give you hope that there are many, many professionals out there who could potentially uh, help you. And then the third problem, I think, is we still treat Parkinson's as a one-size-fits-all problem, whereas Parkinson's really is a very personal problem. It is, we, I was invited to write the most prestigious paper in my life, which will come out in The Lancet next month or so. And in that paper, I've said, not tongue in cheek, but I meant it very seriously, that there are 7 million different Parkinson's diseases in the world, namely all of you. You all have your own unique different disease. And, uh, but instead, I think many physicians uh, still treat Parkinson's as if, it, as if it is a very homogeneous uh, condition. This is the spirit in my team. Uh, the man with the laptop is a real patient uh, in, uh, in my clinic. And as you can see, he's in the inner circle together with the neurologist, the nurse, the physiotherapist, the speech language therapist. We, we, at the Rotbout, we see patients truly as a partner in healthcare, not the object of our good intentions, but a full member of the team. And I just want to flag this paper to you, which, which has really inspired me. It's, it's the one paper where you wish you had been an author, but I'm not, unfortunately. It's about the new definition of health. The old definition of health is the complete absence of any physical, mental, or social unwell being, which makes neither of us today healthy. I have a, a minor radiculopathy currently, so I'm sick or ill, but I function actually very well. And the reason is that in this paper, people said that the new definition of health is the ability to adapt and self-manage. And if there is one thing that I enjoy about my profession as a neurologist, as a, as a consultant, is the tremendous resilience of patients and their families in, in how you folks cope with the disease. And what is to me really inspiring is to learn from you. You are my mentors, you are my teachers, you are my muse that help me by learning from how you cope in helping other patients better. And this is just a beautiful illustration. I saw this at Schiphol Airport. I took a picture. This man would be ill or sick according to the old WHO definition of health, but he's healthy according to the new definition of health. And I think it is a very inspiring photo. 
Thank you very much, Baz and Ray. Um, I'm Kevin McFarthing. I'm the research liaison for the Oxford branch of Parkinson's UK. And I'll be moderating the Q&A session. We had several questions about advocacy, basically asking what is the best thing we as parents, as patients and carers can do to change the minds of the decision makers. So first I'll start with a shameless plug. So if you haven't gotten our book, so you can, you can get the book. So that's the first step. All the authors are donating all proceeds, Boss, Michael, Todd, and I, to efforts to end Parkinson's. So that's one thing you can do right now. Second um, is you can join the PD Avengers. So our colleague, Larry Gifford, who's an American who lives in Canada, has uh, formed a new organization called the PD Avengers. This is a grassroots organization. We're not uh, part of it. We're happy to support it, but we're not part of it uh, with people with Parkinson's infected by it to get their word out. I have worked in the Parkinson field uh, since 1989. I've been deeply motivated and de dedicated my life to improving quality of life for people with Parkinson's. I love working with families with Parkinson's, but I've also seen how you are truly among the kindest people on the planet. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart and I can speak from over 30 years of experience. And I think it is time to raise your voice. I think the Parkinson world and community has been too silent, too passive. We've been waiting, letting things happen. Um, Parkinson's can be a very debilitating disease. It's the fastest growing disease on the planet. It's partially a preventable disease. And even though it may sound frustrating, when you raise your voice on your own, collectively, we have 7 million voices on this planet. And really the book, this moment is a call to action and each voice counts. Mark Tillings has just um, put a question in the, in the chat box, which is related to this. Is the, is the fundamental problem that it's often seen as a disease of old age, despite one in 20 being under 40? Yes, I, I, I'll gladly take that. I think that is absolutely a complete mistake. Yes, Parkinson's is an age-related disease, which means that the risk for a 90-year-old is higher than the risk for an 80-year-old. But the peak of the disease is in people between 50 and 70, which is when you are in the midst of life, oftentimes still working, um, when you want to enjoy maybe travel with your family, your children or your grandchildren. 20%, around 20% is under 50. Some 10% is under 40. My youngest patient is 13, one three. That's exceptional, of course, but it is a complete misconception that Parkinson's disease is a disease of people who are sort of on the, on the way out, you know, on the edge of society. It's a disease that affects active people who want to enjoy and deserve to enjoy life. So we need to actively work on that misconception. The next, next question comes back to the impact of, of head injuries and concussion. Um, so should there be a reduction or even a ban on head contact in sport? Um, yeah. So a number of studies have now shown that there is an increased risk of developing Parkinson's in those with recurrent head trauma. So uh, I, I use the word recurrent on purpose because some people think that that one concussion that you sustained at age 20 is the cause of your Parkinson's now. As far as we know, there is no relation between a single event and your Parkinson's today. I'm saying that to reassure you because sometimes people think, oh gosh, if I hadn't had that you know, one single accident. What we do know is that in football players uh, and other people who are prone to receive uh, recurrent head trauma, uh, yes, the risk of developing Parkinson's is increased. So we should prevent a younger generation, for example, American football players, but also people uh, in, uh, in other types of sports or other workplaces where you might be at risk of sustaining head injury. Better protection is part of the answer to the Parkinson pandemic. We had quite a few questions on exercise as well. I think the best one is from Paul Mayhew Archer. Paul, Paul asks, I exercise to music, and the piece of music that accompanies my daily exercise routine is the minute waltz. What practical tips can you give me to make me take more exercise? Aha, it's a brilliant question. So, well, first of all, let me emphasize to all of you two things. One, exercise is now a class one evidence intervention to improve your symptoms, just like a drug 
just like levodopa, I urge you to do it every day. If you do it three times a week, there's always tomorrow. If you build a new regime where you exercise every day, there is no ifs, ands, or buts. You have to exercise. Immediately after exercise, you may likely experience a temporary worsening of your Parkinson's symptoms, which sometimes causes people to stop exercising because they think they've done something harmful. The opposite is true. See it as a medal for your good behavior. So aerobic exercise, daily basis, 30 to 45 minutes, panting, but still maintaining a conversation. I said the toughest question till last again asked by several people in one form or another. Um, when do you think we will have the ability to effectively stop the progress of Parkinson's? And when do you think we'll be able to prevent it? I think stopping the disease is a long way to go. Slowing, I would say, is within reasonable reach. Ray? So let's take a history lesson. Um, so 1938 is when the March of Dimes uh, was started in the United States to raise money uh, for polio, 2.7 million dimes were mailed to the White House to develop a vaccine for polio. 1953, 1954, Jonas Salk creates that vaccine. Polio is eradicated from the United States, eradicated from England, and eradicated from virtually every part of the world, 16 years. 1981, uh, uh, first reports of something called known as Kaposi sarcoma, a tumor associated with HIV is reported in the New York Times. There's no federal response in the United States. And in fact, uh, victims are blamed for their own condition that they unknowingly uh, developed. 1996, uh, protease inhibitors are uh, introduced. Uh, wards of uh, individuals dying from HIV are emptied. People with HIV live near normal uh, life expectancies today. A more treatable condition, by the way, uh, more accessible treatments than even levodopa for Parkinson's 15 or 16 years. 1980s, the leading cause of a death among uh, teenagers and young adults are cat car accidents, overwhelmingly from drunk drivers. 1980, the Mothers Against Drunk Driving is formed by the mid 90s and certainly by the 2000s, uh, uh, drunk driving becomes socially unacceptable. And I, I never even have to lecture my four teenage boys about uh, drunk driving because it's a, of course it's obvious. What were you a fool doing drinking and driving when you were a teenager, dad? I didn't do that, but that's, that's what they would say. Um, so 15, uh, 20 years. But in all those cases, no change occurred until people affected by the disease made their voices heard. No change occurs until people affected by the disease makes their voices heard. When people make their voices heard and heard loudly, in the span of 15 years, you can change the course of a disease, whether that's HIV, whether that's polio, or whether that's drunk driving. So the challenge is, is, when do we make our voices heard collectively and in unison and uh, end the silence surrounding Parkinson's disease? When we make that, add 15 years and we can change the course of the disease. And now I'm really pleased and proud to introduce our Parkinson's UK president, Jane Asher. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be very quick because uh, it's been such a fantastic evening, but we are running a little bit late. First of all, I mean, obviously, thank you to Ray and Baz. That was extraordinary. Uh, I think we would all love to be to be treated by Baz, no question, and to be pushed for by Ray. I mean, what two inspiring people. Thank you very, very much. Um, I suppose I'd, I just want to remind you about Parkinson's UK, that we are there for everybody with Parkinson's. We are also, as I know you're well aware, putting huge amounts of money into research and continuing to do so. There were a few questions about the GDNF trials, which were so frustrating. Believe me, I am as frustrated as you all are. Watch this space. We haven't seen the end of that. It, it was really annoying how we didn't get perhaps a fair result from that. Please stay with Parkinson's UK. Please join PD Avengers. Please support the branches, which are doing so much for everybody and helped my dear late brother-in-law my Parkinson's so very much and thank you all for coming and thank you Ray and Baz particularly.